Thank you very much, Narendra. Great to be with you this morning. Our research and development team was tasked with answering the question, how are we doing? Will we do and will we reimagine mission differently as a result of the pandemic? So we undertook various research activities from April to September 2020. And today I'm sharing highlights from three of those. A literature review on emerging missional trends during the pandemic, frontline phone and online surveys with our frontline church leaders and centre managers to understand their experience and thinking during and just after lockdown one, and a PESELS analysis looking at the external political, economic, social, technological, legal, environmental and spiritual landscape to reveal COVID-19's impact. Starting with what we learned around congregations, the literature review identified eight overarching themes. Above all, authors emphasized the need to love and serve your neighbor by socially distancing and following government guidelines and by risking self to properly support those in need. Beyond that, mission looked like challenging inequalities, pointing people to the promise of a better world, bolstered by constant prayer, especially creating space to listen to God and discern God's heart, taking time to lament pain and suffering, being present as God's presence in local communities, getting out of buildings, listening authentically to marginalized people and challenging Western individualism, being Im imaginative and innovative in mission, allowing the Holy Spirit to move the church out of its comfort zone and proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And from Pestles, we saw chaplaincy emerge as a key engagement point with the public during the crisis, bridging a gap between individuals and institutional church. 99% of our phone respondents undertook both outward facing activities, such as food parcel or meals distribution, shopping, crisis support, schools ministry, drop in, employment support and pastoral support to their community and provided pastoral support to their regular attendees, staff and volunteers. 89% reported engaging in food parcel distribution directly or in partnership with other agencies. 73% reported undertaking online worship in some settings, this attracted a wider audience than reached pre-lockdown, but the level of engagement was unclear. Over 50% found preparation of online worship challenging and congregants' lack of online access or knowledge was challenging in over two thirds of settings. The most cited type of collaboration taking place at churches was with their local headquarters or other Salvation Army churches, as we supported by 90%, followed by collaboration with at least one of a range of community groups, agencies or other denominations at 89%. When asked by phone what mission meant to them at this time, 42% of our church leaders described some form of responding to need with 24% of them emphasising the church's responsibility to know the specific needs of their community. Responding to need was closely followed by describing mission as extending Jesus to everyone, the need to proclaim the good news, and a more inward-looking emphasis on pastoral care to their current congregation. When asked what they felt God was saying to them about mission in the future, 23% of church leaders felt God was telling them to reassess, slow down, reflect and listen to him. There was also a sense of needing to get out of buildings and into the community to focus on building relationships, being brave and creative. The top 10 responses reflected the need to change either partially or completely. Turning to social mission delivered through our contracted services, 
the most commonly cited activities varied by the specific service type. The most cited form of collaboration taking place within anti-trafficking and modern slavery, employment and homelessness services was with a range of community organisations. Whereas all our older people's services have been collaborating with health services. When asked by phone what mission meant to them at this time, our contracted services staff most commonly said that it was supporting people. 17% articulated a need to keep people safe as key, while 23% described it as being there for people, journeying alongside them. They also felt that God was telling them to slow down, reassess, reflect and listen to God to be adaptable, creative, and share the love of God with others, especially through loving their neighbors. Challenges in our contracted services included building relationships with service users, meeting their unmet needs, supporting them with life skills, and maintaining a sense of safety. Over 80% had found it challenging to use their building spaces during lockdown. Looking across the board, 60% of online respondents said their workload had increased despite 80% saying that their programme had reduced. Staff being furloughed and volunteer shielding had reduced people resources in some cases. Scores for physical health and psychological well-being amongst frontline leaders and managers fell below pre-pandemic norms. Well-being, particularly mental health, is a concern for church leaders, managers, staff, congregants and service users. Church leaders who've provided care and support in stressful times are recognised as particularly vulnerable and we could see a delayed impact on them. Half of our online respondents found innovation challenging. Other key complex interlinked issues are that geographic, socioeconomic, gender, age, ethnic, digital and environmental inequalities have been compounded or exacerbated with long and short term contributors to inequalities like domestic violence increasing in prevalence. A shift from volunteering to mutual aid schemes has emerged. Brexit's long term impact is unknown, but analysis suggests challenges mirroring the pandemic will emerge, increasing their extent and scope. Rough sleeping figures are rising again, and there's opportunity to capitalise on the positive environmental gains of lockdown one. We found that due to COVID's complex impact, it's vital that we consider the interconnected nature of any actions. We recognise that engaging in partnership working is key and any decisions must be preceded by prayerful reflection. David's going to share some specific examples of interfaith activities we were involved in. My responsibility covers the whole of the UK and so I looked at Scotland, England, Wales, Ireland and the Republic where we also work and the, the variety of responses have been incredible from encouraging people to take vaccines, which has been a, a joint exercise with different faith groups in South London, in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, in Ireland and in England itself. West Midlands, the police authority there, has put together an interfaith working group of which the Salvation Army is part. And one of their aims during COVID-19 is to encourage people to take vaccines, particularly in the BME group, which are sometimes reluctant to do so. Uh, in the Birmingham area, food parcels came up in every conversation I had. Canuck has come up with an incredible innovation of a school uniform bank as opposed to food bank. So deprived families who can't, haven't got the money for school uniforms can access them through the food bank once they've been cleaned and ironed. Uh, in other areas in Rains Park for instance um, the officer there has spoken to the local Armenian mosque and has been invited by their ladies group to talk about vaccinations. I can go on and on and on about that right across the country. 
in Scotland, an interesting partnership has, has developed between the mosque in Kilmarnock and the Air Salvation Army. The public have been incredibly generous with food parcels, far more than the Air Salvation Army could deal with. And so they got in contact with various other faith groups, such as the Kilmana Mosque. And they, every two weeks and less sometimes, take up to two car loads of food, which is not uh, required in air and given in Kilmarnock. Now, it was interesting in a conversation the officer had with the Imam, the food that they receive, they're distributing among everybody. So it's reciprocal. It's not just Christians helping Christians or Muslims helping Muslims or Sikhs helping Sikhs, but it's helping everybody in the community, as Pam has indicated. In two Ireland, minutes to go, two minutes to go. In Ireland, and it won't take two minutes, but there's a lot going on there. Uh, they're the first faith responder to the emergency. So when the morgues are full, sadly, as they were, the Salvation Army is contacted and they get in contact with the other faith groups. Some of the faith groups are quite small in that part of the world, and therefore they feel quite lonely. So when they lose somebody, to have someone be there on the spot helping them is an incredible relief. Uh, the universities of Dublin and Queen's University in Belfast have done surveys in their communities on during COVID-19 about child neglect and abuse. And these are available and are very much uh, involving multi-faith groups both countries, Northern Ireland and the Republic. And that's just touching the surface. That was three days phone calls and I haven't done all parts of the country. It's been quite encouraging to see the way that we're working together and supporting each other. That's to the glory of God, amen.